Almoravid dynasty. The Almoravid dynasty, in Rebdin, Almuravidjan, was an imperial Berber Muslim dynasty centered in Morocco. It established an empire in the 11th century that stretched over the western Maghreb and Al Andalus. Founded by Abdali ibn Yashin, the Almoravid capital was Marrakesh, a city the ruling house founded in 1062. The dynasty originated among the Lamtuna and the Gudala, nomadic Berber tribes of the Sahara, traversing the territory between the Dra, the Niger, and the Senegal rivers. The Almoravids were crucial in preventing the fall of Al Andalus to the Iberian Christian kingdoms, when they decisively defeated a coalition of the Castilian and Aragonese armies at the Battle of Sagrajas in 1086. This enabled them to control an empire that stretched 3,000 kilometers, 1,900 miles, north to south. However, the rule of the dynasty was relatively short lived. The Almoravids fell, at the height of their power, when they failed to stop the Masmuda led rebellion initiated by Ibn Tumart. As a result, their last king Ishaq ibn Ali was killed in Marrakesh in April 1147 by the Almohad Caliphate, who replaced them as a ruling dynasty both in Morocco and Al Andalus. The term Al Muravid comes from the Arabic Al Muravidjan, which is the plural form of Al Muravid, literally meaning one who is tying but figuratively meaning one who is ready for battle at a fortress. The term is related to the notion of Ribat, a frontier monastery fortress, through the root RBT, Rabat, to tie to unite or Rabat. To encamp. The name Al Muravid was tied to a school of Malachite law called Dar al Murabid and founded in Sus al Aqsa, modern day Morocco, by a scholar named Wagag ibn Zalu. Ibn Zalu sent his student Abdallah ibn Yashin to preach Malachite Islam to the Sanaj of Berbers of the Su and Adrar, present day Mauritania. Hence, the name of the Al Muravids comes from the followers of the Dar al Murabid and the house of those who were bound together in the cause of God. It is uncertain exactly when or why the Almoravids acquired that appellation. al bakri writing in 1068, before their apex, already calls them the al muravidjan but does not clarify the reasons for it. Writing three centuries later, Ibn Abi Zar suggested it was chosen early on by Abdallah ibn Yashin because, upon finding resistance among the Gudala Berbers of Adrar, Mauritania, to his teaching, he took a handful of followers to erect a makeshift ribbit. Monastery fortress on an offshore island, possibly Tidra Island, in the Bay of Barguin. Ibn Idari wrote that the name was suggested by Ibn Yashin in the persevering in the fight sense, to boost morale after a particularly hard fought battle in the Dra Valley circa 1054, in which they had taken many losses. Whichever explanation is true, it seems certain the appellation was chosen by the Almoravids for themselves, partly with the conscious goal of forestalling any tribal or ethnic identification. The name might be related to the ribbit of Wagag ibn Zalu in the village of Aglu, near present-day Tiznit, where the future Almoravid spiritual leader Abdallah ibn Yashin got his initial training. The 13th-century Moroccan biographer Ibn al-Zayat al-Tadili, and Qadiyad before him in the 12th century, note that Wagag's learning center was called Dar al-Muravidin, the house of the Almoravids, and that might have inspired Ibn Yashin's choice of name Fourth Movement. Contemporaries frequently referred to them as the Almalathamin, the Veiled Ones, from Litham, Arabic for veil. The Almoravids veiled themselves below the eyes with a taglamust, a custom they adapted from southern Sanaja Berbers. This can still be seen among the modern Tuareg people, but it was unusual further north, although practical for the desert dust, the Almoravids insisted on wearing the veil everywhere, as a badge of foreignness in urban settings partly as a way of emphasizing their Puritan credentials. It served as the uniform of the Almoravids. It was worn in remembrance of the Sanaj's escape from Yemen disguised as women, thus making it simultaneously an indication of their faith. Under their rule, sumptuary laws forbade anybody else from wearing the veil, thereby making it the distinctive dress of the ruling class. In turn, the succeeding Amahads made a point of mocking the Almoravid veil as symbolic of effeminacy and decadence. The Berbers of the Tamaza in the early Middle Ages could be roughly classified into three major groups, the Zenata across the north, the Masmuda concentrated in central Morocco, and the Sanaja, clustered in two areas, the western part of the Sahara and the hills of the eastern Maghreb. The eastern Sanaja included the Kotama Berbers, who had been the base of the Fatimid rise in the early 10th century, and the Zirid dynasty, who ruled Afrikia as vassals of the Fatimids after the latter moved to Egypt in 972. The western Sanaja were divided into several tribes, the Gazula and the Lumpa in the Dra Valley in the foothills of the Anti-Atlas Range, further south, encamped in the western Sahara Desert, were the Masufa, the Lumtuna in the Banu Warth, 
and most southerly of all, the Gudala, or Judala, in literal Mauritania down to the borderlands of the Senegal River. The western Sanaja had been converted to Islam some time in the 9th century. They were subsequently united in the 10th century and, with the zeal of neophyte converts, launched several campaigns against the Sudanese, pagan peoples of sub-Saharan Africa. Under their king Tinbarut and Ibn Yus Faishar, the Sanaja Limtuna erected, or captured, the citadel of Autogast, a critical stop on the trans-Saharan trade route. After the collapse of the Sanaja Union, Autogast passed over to the Ghana Empire and the Trans-Saharan routes were taken over by the Zenata Magrawa of Shijil Massa. The Magrawa also exploited this disunion to dislodge the Sanaja Gazula and Lamda out of their pasture lands in the Suindra Valley's daughter around 1035. The Lamtuna chieftain Abu Abdallah Muhammad ibn Tifat, alias Tarsina, tried to reunite the Sanaja desert tribes, but his reign lasted less than three years. Around 1040, Yahya ibn Ibrahim, a chieftain of the Gudala, and brother-in-law of the late Tarsina, went on pilgrimage to Mecca. On his return, he stopped by Kairawan in Afriqiya, where he met Abu Imran al-Fasi, a native of Fez and a jurist and scholar of the Sunni Maliki school. At this time, Afriqiya was in ferment. The Zirid ruler al Moiz ibn Badis, was openly contemplating breaking with his Shiite Fatimid overlords in Cairo, and the jurists of Kairawan were agitating for him to do so. Within this heady atmosphere, Yahya and Abu Imran fell into conversation on the state of the faith in their western homelands, and Yahya expressed his disappointment at the lack of religious education and negligence of Islamic law among his southern Sanaja people. With Abu Imran's recommendation, Yahya ibn Ibrahim made his way to the rivet of Wagag ibn Zalyu in the Sioux Valley of southern Morocco, to seek out a Maliki teacher for his people. Wagag assigned him one of his residents, Abdallah ibn Yashin. Abdallah ibn Yashin was a Gazula Berber and probably a convert rather than a born Muslim. His name can be read as son of Yasin, the title of the 36th surah of the Quran, suggesting he had obliterated his family past and was reborn of the holy book. Ibn Yashin certainly had the ardor of a Puritan zealot, his creed was mainly characterized by a rigid formalism and a strict adherence to the dictates of the Quran, and the orthodox tradition. Chroniclers such as al-Bakri allege Ibn Yashin's learning was superficial. Ibn Yashin's initial meetings with the Gudala people went poorly. As he had more ardor than depth, Ibn Yashin's arguments were disputed by his audience. He responded to questioning with charges of apostasy and handed out harsh punishments for the slightest deviations. The Gudala soon had enough and expelled him almost immediately after the death of his protector, Yahya ibn Ibrahim, sometime in the 1040s. Ibn Yashin, however, found a more favorable reception among the neighboring Lumtuna people. Probably sensing the useful organizing power of Ibn Yasin's pious fervor, the Lamtuna chieftain Yahya ibn Umar al-Lamtuni invited the man to preach to his people. The Lamtuna leaders, however, kept Ibn Yashin on a careful leash, forging a more productive partnership between them. Invoking stories of the early life of Muhammad, Ibn Yashin preached that conquest was a necessary addendum to Islamicization, that it was not enough to merely adhere to God's law, but necessary to also destroy opposition to it. In Ibn Yashin's ideology, anything and everything outside of Islamic law could be characterized as opposition. He identified tribalism, in particular, as an obstacle. He believed it was not enough to urge his audiences to put aside their blood loyalties and ethnic differences, and embrace the equality of all Muslims under the sacred law, it was necessary to make them do so. For the Lumtuna leadership, this new ideology dovetailed with their long desire to refound the Sanaja Union and recover their lost dominions. In the early 1050s, the Lamtuna, under the joint leadership of Yahya ibn Umar and Abdallah ibn Yashin, soon calling themselves the al Murabitin, al Moravids, set out on a campaign to bring their neighbors over to their cause. From the year 1053, the al Moravids began to spread their religious way to the Berber areas of the Sahara, and to the region south of the desert. After winning over the Sanaja Berber tribe, they quickly took control of the entire desert trade route seizing Shijil Masa at the northern end in 1054, and Aouda Ghost at the southern end in 1055. Yahya ibn Umar was killed in a battle in 1057, but Abdul ibn Yashin, whose influence as a religious teacher was paramount, named his brother Abu Bekar ibn Umar as chief. Under him, the Almoravids soon began to spread their power beyond the desert, and conquered the tribes of the Atlas Mountains. They then came in contact with the Burguada, a Berber tribal confederation, who followed an Islamic heresy preached by Salih ibn Tarif three centuries earlier. 
the Burguada resisted. Abdullah ibn Yashin was killed in battle with them in 1059, in Krifla, a village near Amani, Morocco. They were, however, completely conquered by Abu Bakr ibn Umar, and were forced to convert to Orthodox Islam. Abu Bakr married a noble and wealthy Berber woman, Zainab bin Absawiyat, who would become very influential in the development of the dynasty. Zainab was the daughter of a wealthy merchant from Huara, who was said to be from Kairouan. In 1061, Abu Bakr ibn Umar made a division of the power he had established, handing over the more settled parts to his cousin Yusuf ibn Tashfin as viceroy, and also assigning to him his favorite wife Zainab. Ibn Umar kept the task of suppressing the revolts that had broken out in the desert. When he returned to resume control, he found his cousin too powerful to be superseded. In November 1087, Abu Bakr was killed in battle, according to oral tradition by a narrow, while fighting in the historic region of the Sudan. Yusuf ibn Tashfin had in the meantime brought the large area of what is now known as Morocco, Western Sahara, and Mauritania into complete subjection. In 1062, he founded the city of Marrakesh. In 1080, he conquered the kingdom of Tlemkin, in modern day Algeria, and founded the present city of that name, his rule extending as far east as Oran. According to Arab tradition, the Almoravids conquered the Ghana Empire sometime around 1076 CE. An example of this tradition is the record of historian Ibn Khaldun, who cited Sheikh Uthman, the Faki of Ghana, writing in 1394. According to this source, the Almoravids weakened Ghana and collected tribute from Sudan, to the extent that the authority of the rulers of Ghana dwindled away, and they were subjugated and absorbed by the Susu, a neighboring people of the Sudan. Traditions in Mali related that the Soso attacked and took over Mali as well, and the ruler of the Soso, Sumero Kante took over the land. However criticism from Conrad and Fisher, 1982, argued that the notion of any Almoravid military conquest at its core is merely perpetuated folklore, derived from a misinterpretation or naive reliance on Arabic sources. According to Professor Timothy and Saul, the archaeology of ancient Ghana simply does not show the signs of rapid change and destruction that would be associated with any Almoravid-era military conquests. Dirk Lang agreed with the original military incursion theory but argues that this doesn't preclude Almoravid political agitation, claiming that the main factor of the demise of Ghana Empire owed much to the latter. According to Lang, the Almoravid religious influence was gradual and not heavily involved in military strife, there the Almoravids increased in power by marrying among the nation's nobility. Lang attributes the decline of ancient Ghana to numerous unrelated factors, only one of which can be likely attributable to internal dynastic struggles that were instigated by Almoravid influence and Islamic pressures, but devoid of military conversion and conquest. This interpretation of events has been disputed by later scholars like Cheryl L. Burkhalter, 1992, who argued that, whatever the nature of the conquest in the south of the Sahara, the influence and success of the Almoravid movement in securing West African gold and circulating it widely necessitated a high degree of political control. The traditional position says that the ensuing war with the Almoravids pushed Ghana over the edge, ending the kingdom's position as a commercial and military power by 1,100. It collapsed into tribal groups and chieftaincies, some of which later assimilated into the Almoravids while others founded the Mali Empire. The Arab geographer al Zuri wrote that the Almoravids ended Ibadism in Tad Mecca in 1084 and that Abu Bekr arrived at the Mountain of Gold in the Deep South. After the death of Abu Bekr, 1087, the confederation of Berber tribes in the Sahara was divided between the descendants of Abu Bekr and his brother Yahya, and would have lost control of Ghana. Cheryl Burkhalter suggests that Abu Bekr's son Yahya was the leader of the Almoravid expedition that conquered Ghana in 1076 and that the Almoravids would have survived the loss of Ghana and the defeat in the Maghreb by the Almohads, and would have ruled the Sahara until the end of the 12th century. In 1086 Yusuf ibn Tashfin was invited by the Muslim Taifa princes of Al-Andalus in the Iberian Peninsula to defend their territories from the encroachment of Alfonso VI, King of Leon and Castile. In that year, Yusuf ibn Tashfin crossed the Strait of Gibraltar to al Haythiras and defeated Castile at the Battle of az Zayaka Battle of Sagrajas. He was prevented from following up his victory by trouble in Africa, which he chose to settle in person. He returned to Iberia in 1090, avowedly for the purpose of annexing the Taifa principalities of Iberia. He was supported by most of the Iberian people, who were discontented with the heavy taxation imposed upon them by their spendthrift rulers. Their religious teachers, as well as others in the East, 
most notably, Al-Ghazali in Persia and Al-Tartoshi in Egypt, who was himself an Iberian by birth from Tortosa, detested the Taifa rulers for their religious indifference. The clerics issued a fatwa, a non-binding legal opinion, that Yusuf was of sound morals and had the religious right to dethrone the rulers, whom he saw as heterodox in their faith. By 1094, Yusuf had annexed most of the major tafas, with the exception of the one at Saragossa. The Almoravids were victorious at the Battle of Consugra, during which the son of El Cid, Diego Rodriguez, perished. Alfonso, with some Leonese, retreated into the castle of Consugra, which was besieged for eight days until the Almoravids withdrew to the south. After friendly correspondence with the Caliph at Baghdad, whom he acknowledged as Amir al Mu'minin, commander of the faithful, Yusuf ibn Tashfin in 1097 assumed the title of Amir al-Muslimin, commander of the Muslims. He died in 1106, when he was reputed to have reached the age of 100. The Almoravid power was at its height at Yusuf's death, the Moorish Empire then included all of northwest Africa as far eastward as Algiers, and all of Iberia south of the Tagus and as far eastward as the mouth of the Ebro, and including the Balearic Islands. In 1108 Damim al-Yusuf defeated the Kingdom of Castile at the Battle of Ucles. Yusuf did not reconquer much territory from the Christian kingdoms, except that of Valencia, but he did hinder the progress of the Christian Reconquista by uniting al-Andalus. In 1134 at the Battle of Fraga the Almoravids dynasty was victorious and even succeeded in slaying Alfonso I of Aragon in the battle. Three years afterwards, under Yusuf's son and successor, Ali ibn Yusuf, Sintra and Santarim were added, and he invaded Iberia again in 1119 and 1121, but the tide had turned, as the French had assisted the Aragonese to recover Saragossa. In 1138, Ali ibn Yusuf was defeated by Alfonso VII of Leon, and in the Battle of Aurique, 1139, by Afonso I of Portugal, who thereby won his crown. Lisbon was conquered by the Portuguese in 1147. According to some scholars, Ali ibn Yusuf was a new generation of leadership that had forgotten the desert life for the comforts of the city. He was defeated by the combined action of his Christian foes in Iberia and the agitation of Almohads, the Muwahids, in Morocco. After Ali ibn Yusuf's death in 1143, his son Tashfin ibn Ali lost ground rapidly before the Almohads. In 1146, he was killed in a fall from a precipice while attempting to escape after a defeat near Oran. His two successors were Ibrahim ibn Tashfin and Ishaq ibn Ali, but their reigns were short. The conquest of the city of Marrakesh by the Yamahads in 1147 marked its fall of the dynasty, though fragments of the Almoravids continued to struggle throughout the empire. Among these fragments, there was the rebel Yahya al-Sarawiya, who resisted Amahad rule in the Maghreb for eight years after the fall of Marrakesh before surrendering in 1155. Also in 1155. The remaining Almoravids were forced to retreat to the Balearic Islands and later at Frakia under the leadership of the Banu Ghania, who were eventually influential in the downfall of their conquerors, the Almohads, in the eastern part of the Maghreb. Abdallah ibn Yazin imposed very strict discipline measures on his forces for every breach of his laws. The Almoravids' first military leader, Yahya ibn Umar al-Lamtuni, gave them a good military organization. Their main force was infantry armed with javelins in the front ranks and pikes behind, which formed into a phalanx, and was supported by camelmen and horsemen on the flanks. They also had a flag carrier at the front who guided the forces behind him. When the flag was upright, the combatants behind would stand and when it was turned down, they would sit. al bakri reports that, while in combat, the Almoravids did not pursue those who fled in front of them. Their fighting was intense and they did not retreat when disadvantaged by an advancing opposing force they preferred death over defeat. These characteristics were possibly unusual at the time. After the death of El Cid, Christian Chronicles reported a legend of a Turkish woman leading a band of 300 Amazons, black female archers. This legend was possibly inspired by the ominous veils on the faces of the warriors and their dark skin colored blue by the indigo of their robes. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.